Summary Discipline is Destiny, The Power of Self-Control, Ryan Holiday. Book link click here, we live in an era of unprecedented freedom and abundance. Yet we are primarily unhappy and unfulfilled. The reason is that we mistake liberty for license. Freedom requires self-discipline to be meaningful. Self-restrained, temperance, moderation, this virtue has been valued across cultures and time. It is essential for channeling our opportunities and blessings into a good life. Though we have more access, power, and privilege than ever, we must cultivate wisdom and judgment to use what we've been appropriately given. A mere license leads to chaos and suffering. Self-discipline bridges freedom and excellence, empowerment and actualization, privilege, and purpose. It is what transforms liberty into a blessing rather than a curse. The present era demands that individuals rule over themselves since we have so few external restraints or limitations. We must choose moderation and balance, not excess. We must govern our impulses and not be governed by them. In short, the more freedom we have, the more essential virtue, especially temperance, becomes. Would we have a great life? Rule over yourself. We must exercise self-discipline and temperance to rule over our physical selves and avoid ruin or imbalance. Lack of self-control puts us in danger of being dominated by external forces or our baser urges. Freedom requires discipline. Discipline gives us freedom and allows us to reach our full potential. Self-discipline is the key to greatness. Those we admire most, like Eisenhower, accomplished so much through restraint and self-mastery. Those who lack discipline, like Napoleon, destroyed themselves. Our physical bodies require discipline. We must subjugate them to our will or risk being castaways. The Stoics valued endurance, modesty, and temperance. Though not about perfect tabs, discipline gives us the fortitude for life's life's difficulties. If we don't do not rule our bodies, laziness, and decay will. We do the work because it sits our purpose. Though indulgence seems easier, discipline is less painful. Examples of self-discipline, Lou Gehrig played baseball through illness and injury. Marcus Aurelius chose philosophy over decadence. Finding purpose and duty, Winston Churchill remained defiant in the face of Nazi aggression. Their physical self-mastery mirrored their strength of will and purpose. Lack of discipline destroys from within. Alexander the Great and King George IV lacked restraint and purpose, indulging their appetites and killing themselves. Meaning and self-control are intertwined, submitting the physical leads to aimlessness and ruin. The path is long, with many temptations. Discipline keeps us on the course, helping us avoid blind alleys and mirages toward greatness and freedom. Mastery of the body is mastery of the self, allowing us to go the distance. So, in summary, the law of the universe is that self-discipline, specifically discipline of our physical selves, is essential to freedom, purpose, and human flourishing. Restraint and temperance strengthen us, indulgence destroys us. The battle for self-mastery is lifelong but allows us to reach our highest potential. Here's here's a summary. Lou Gehrig played in 2,130 consecutive Major League Baseball games for the New York Yankees from 1925 to 1939. This was an incredible feat of physical endurance and mental toughness. Gehrig grew up poor in New York City, the son of German immigrants. He was often teased as a child but developed his athletic skills at a local gymnastics club. He worked extremely hard to become a great baseball player. Gehrig was an incredibly dedicated and disciplined athlete. He saw baseball as almost a religious calling and was a slave to the game. He trained and practiced relentlessly. He played through injuries, pain, and exhaustion. Gary loved the game of baseball and felt fortunate just to be able to play. He respected all aspects of the game and never showboated. His passion and work ethic made him an inspiration to his teammates. Gary lived a clean lifestyle focused on maximizing his athletic performance. He avoided drinking, partying, and reckless behavior. He knew that abusing his body would compromise his ability to succeed. Discipline brought rewards. Early in his career, Gehrig learned that relying on alcohol to relieve stress and improve his play was unsustainable. With the guidance of a coach, he developed better coping skills and avoided drinking to reach his full potential. Gehrig was not just focused on baseball. He was a kind, humble, and generous man devoted to his family and community. His tragic death from ALS at age 37 shortened a life of purpose and service. Gehrig's Gehrig's extraordinary accomplishments, character, and courage in adversity made him an American icon and hero. His legacy lives on as an inspiration. Lou Gehrig had an unstoppable ambition to be a great baseball player. Nothing could deter him from that goal. He was intensely disciplined and hardworking. He lived and avoided excess or complacency. Gehrig played through injuries and never complained. He held the record for consecutive games played for decades. 
Despite declining due to ALS, he continued to play at an elite level through sheer determination and toughness. Gehrig finally removed himself from the lineup when he felt he could no longer help the team. It was a tough decision, but he showed good judgment and unselfishness. Even though his body failed him, his character and spirit remained. He left behind an inspiring example of perseverance, hard work, humility, and courage in adversity. Gehrig lived his life with urgency and purpose. He made the most of his opportunities and talents. Though his life and career were cut short, his legacy lives on. He showed what can be accomplished through non-stop ambition, self-control, and refusing to yield in the face of challenges or setbacks. Gehrig epitomizes determination, work ethic, and giving one's own all until you simply can't anymore. His life is an inspiration and reminder to make the most of each day and each chance you get. The example of King George IV illustrates the consequences of neglecting one's own health and physical fitness. His gluttony, overindulgence, and laziness eventually caught up to him, and he died at a relatively young age. No one has ever found happiness through overeating, overdrinking, or avoiding exercise and hard work. At best, it leads to regret and health problems. At worst, an early death. In contrast, Lou Gehrig lived a life of discipline, temperance, and pushing his physical limits. Though he died young, he accomplished great things and served as an inspiration. His life showed that mastery over the material leads to mastery over life. The main message is that we must overcome our natural inclination towards leisure and comfort and instead adopt the strenuous life. This means maintaining physical discipline, rising early, working hard, enduring difficulties, and mastering our bodies and impulses. Though complex, this creates a sense of purpose and maximizes our potential. Examples like Toni Morrison show that waking early and maintaining a disciplined routine can help one accomplish great things, even in the face of obstacles like a lack of time or demanding responsibilities. The early morning hours are precious for thinking, creating, exercising willpower, and working hard. We must cherish our time and make the most of each day. A life of activity, purpose, and pushing oneself physically and mentally is the best way to honor the gift of life. Rather than being soft or self-indulgent, we should follow the example of our industrious ancestors and tap into traditions of rising early, working hard, and persevering against challenges. The message is stoicism, self-mastery, and making the most of our time through dedicated and purposeful effort. A soft life of leisure leads only to regret, while a strenuous life with a sense of purpose leads to growth and maximizing human potential. Babe Ruth ate and drank excessively, with meals consisting of vast amounts of steak, eggs, potatoes, hot dogs, and soda. This lifestyle eventually caught up to him and caused health issues. In contrast, Theodore Roosevelt overcame a sickly childhood through exercise and physical activity. He advocated for a strenuous life filled with action and movement. We are meant for more than just pleasure-seeking and laziness. We have been given physical gifts that we should use and push to the limit through exercise and activity. Nearly half of Americans can't join the military due to being overweight or out of shape. We need to exercise and eat right to reach our full potential. Difficult times will come, but exercise is within our control. We should swim, lift weights, walk, or do martial arts to build both our body and willpower. Just as Roosevelt overcame obstacles through hard work, we can make strength and determination to overcome our difficulties. Eisenhower quit smoking after 38 years through sheer willpower and determination. We should stop our addictions and dependencies that have power over us. No one should be a slave to sex, money, ambition, or anything else. We must recognize our addictions and then quit them to achieve freedom and autonomy. The habit itself isn't isn't as crucial as leaving the dependency and craving. We must be in control of ourselves rather than controlled by our habits and desires. The key themes are discipline, self-control, willpower, overcoming addiction, and pushing our physical and mental limits through activity and exercise. We should reject excess and quit that which masters us in order to achieve freedom and reach our full potential. Challenging times require determination built through rigorous self-discipline. The passage discusses how avoiding excess and extra things can lead to greater freedom and independence. It points to historical examples like Cato the Elder, who lived frugally and rejected expensive luxuries, and Michelangelo, who avoided gifts and patronage that would make him obligated to others. The passage argues that paring down your life to the essentials makes you less dependent on others and less worried about losing the non-essential things. It suggests asking yourself questions to determine if something is truly necessary or if you're being motivated by fear of missing out or social pressure. The passage then shifts to discussing the importance of organization and maintaining a clean workspace. It points to Robert Moses, who accomplished an incredible amount in his career mainly because he kept his desk clear and processed everything efficiently. In contrast, 
Most people today are overwhelmed by clutter and distraction across paper, digital, and physical spaces. The passage argues that outer order leads to inner calm and clear thinking. It cites author Gretchen Rubin, who said outer order, inner calm. The passage concludes that creativity and productivity start with organizing your physical space. A clean room and transparent surfaces allow your mind to be free. In summary, the key ideas are, avoid excess and extra things to gain independence and freedom. Strip down to the essential. A cluttered life leads to distraction, stress, and less clear thinking. Outer chaos creates inner chaos. Establishing order in your physical space by cleaning and organizing creates the conditions for clear thinking, creativity, and productivity. Ask yourself whether new things you desire are essential and whether being motivated by the right reasons. Maintain a practice of avoiding excess. Historical examples of frugal, minimalist lives show the power of eschewing excess and cultivating self-sufficiency. But the organization and a clean space are also vital. That covers the main points and arguments conveyed in the overall passage. Please let me know if you want me to clarify or expand on any summary part. The space where you work is important. A tidy, orderly workspace leads to better work and outcomes. When things are in their place, creativity and productivity can flow. Preparation and organization or mise en place, allow us to do our best work without distraction or delay. If we make the effort to put things in order, it frees us up to achieve more. Thomas Edison attributed his success to diligence and hard work rather than brilliance or imagination. The key was showing up, coming to work each and every day, even when tired or lacking inspiration. Consistency and perseverance lead to progress and lucky breaks. Doing just one small thing daily can build momentum and open up opportunities. While it may be difficult, it gives you an advantage over those who need to make an effort. Coach John Wooden taught his players that success starts with mastering the fundamentals, even small details like adequately putting on your shoes and socks. What may seem trivial has a huge impact and builds a strong foundation. Ignoring small details leaves one vulnerable to bigger problems down the line. It would help if you had the self-discipline to focus on logistics and the basics to achieve great things. Finally, progress often depends on maintaining a sense of urgency and hustle. Slowness and inaction lead to missed opportunities and failure. To the frustration of all, many leaders and generals have been guilty of not moving their troops or teams quickly enough. Speed and action are usually advantages, allowing one to seize the initiative and gain ground before opponents react. Hustle and quickness pay off. In summary, achieving excellence requires order, diligence, mastery of the basics and a sense of urgency. Focus on preparation, show up for work each day, get the details right, and hustle. That's the formula for success. General George McClellan was a talented military leader but was slow to act and cautious to a fault. Despite having the resources and workforce to defeat the enemy, he needed more urgency and hustle. He took too long to start battles and was reluctant to follow up victories aggressively. His slowness and indecisiveness frustrated President Lincoln. Acting quickly, aggressively, and urgently is crucial in war, business, and life. Those who lack hustle betray their teams and cause. Manny Machado's Machado's excuse that hustling is not my cup of tea shows a lack of discipline and care for his teammates and fans. In contrast, Lou Gehrig believed players always owe it to hustle. We should push ourselves to hustle more in our own lives to show we care about our work and teams. While it's easy to judge others for lacking urgency, we all have a bit of McClellan's McClellan's slowness and reluctance in ourselves. We must overcome laziness, fear, and entitlement and push through challenges. However, hustle must be balanced with deliberation. Acting too hastily can be counterproductive. Octavian, who founded the Roman Empire, believed in make haste slowly. He thought rashness unbecoming of a leader. Success requires discipline pacing, getting the details right, and choosing the right moments to act. General George Thomas's old slow trot shows how to balance hustle and deliberation. Though slow to start, he was committed to the objective. He took time to prepare but then attacked aggressively. His victory at Nashville proved Grant's Grant's impatience wrong. Thomas moved slowly to do things properly, but he never stopped. Success requires practice and preparation. The master swordsman Nakayama Hakuto practiced drawing his sword thousands of times daily to build speed and skill. Extensive practice creates instinct and mastery, allowing split-second decisions and reactions. Musashi defeated an aggressive opponent because the endless course had prepared him for that exact scenario. Success comes from diligent practice over time, not natural talent alone. In summary, while the hustle and a sense of urgency are crucial, they must be balanced with deliberation, discipline, and practice. Hustle for the right reasons, at the correct times, and in the right ways. Move fast, 
But make haste slowly. Success comes to those who work hard and smart, not just hard. Practice intensely and adequately prepare to act swiftly when it counts. Practice and repetition are required to achieve mastery and excellence, lots of exhaustive, repetitive practice. Progress and practice are synonyms. You can't have the former without the latter. Practice makes you better, no matter what you do. Joyce Carol Oates is an example of someone renowned for doing the work. She has published an enormous volume of writing over 50-plus years through consistent hard work and a love of toil. The reward for hard work is not fame or accolades but the work itself. When you find work you're you're meant to do, you do it passionately. It can feel like both torture and heaven. Angela Merkel cultivated a pragmatic and modest personal style that matched her political persona. As a female politician from East Germany, her appearance was scrutinized, but she resisted pressure to change to make a statement. She dressed plainly and properly but avoided trendiness or excess. The Stoics believed you should dress usually and avoid needless luxury, using clothes practically like armor. But they rejected the cynic cynic's notion that philosophers had to abandon societal standards altogether. The critical point is that mastery, excellence, and success require diligent work and practice. For leaders and public figures, how one presents themselves outwardly also matters in establishing credibility and authenticity. But true excellence starts from within not superficial measures. Hard, passionate work is its reward. Does this summary accurately reflect the key messages and ideas in the provided passages? Let me know if you want me to clarify or expand on any summary part. The passage discusses the importance of managing workloads and avoiding burnout. It cites an example from the NBA coach Greg Popovich, who was fined $250,000 for deciding to rest his star players for a game in 2012. However, This strategic rest allowed his team to win two more division titles and a championship. The key reasons Popovich rested his players were, they had just finished a grueling six-game road trip with little rest between games. Two of the games even went into double overtime, requiring extra effort. The lockout shortened season that year contained more back-to-back games than usual, compressing the schedule. Two of his star players had gone straight from the NBA playoffs the previous season into international play for their Olympic teams, giving them little off-season rest. His veteran players like Tim Duncan were aging and required strategic rest to maximize their performance in important games. The passage suggests that managing workloads and avoiding burnout is crucial for achieving peak performance and longevity. Providing strategic rest and recovery for employees or players can allow them to stay healthy, motivated, and operate at a high level, pushing people past their limits, on the other hand, often leads to decreased performance, health issues, decreased motivation, and higher turnover. In summary, The key message is that leaders and managers should keep a close eye on the workloads and schedules of their teams to ensure people are staying energized and energized. Providing adequate rest and recovery is essential for sustaining high performance. Struggling through exhaustion often backfires and leads to worse outcomes. Managing energy and effort at a team level requires a leader's big picture thinking and caring for individuals based on their unique needs and capacities. Greg Popovich coached the San Antonio Spurs for 16 seasons. He had many veteran players with thousands of games of experience. They were a dynasty and consistently made deep playoff runs. In 2012, Popovich controversially decided to rest four of his best players for a nationally televised game. Everyone was angry, the team, fans, TV channels, other coaches, and players. The NBA fined the Spurs. But Popovich was thinking long term. He wanted to manage his players' players' workload and rest them so they would stay healthy for the playoffs and have longer careers. This strategy came to be known as load management. Load management is logical but unpopular. It requires discipline to rest when you want to push forward. Overworking leads to burnout, injuries, rushed and poor decisions, and health issues. James Forrestal was an overworked government official who eventually committed suicide, showing the dangers of undisciplined rest and recovery. Even athletic greats like Lou Gehrig knew when to rest to maintain high performance. You must manage your load and rest to achieve sustained success and a long career. Undisciplined rest and overwork will shorten your career and reduce your potential. Successful people nap, limit work hours, take vacations, and make time to recharge. Sleep is an act of discipline and character, especially during stressful times. Lack of sleep leads to worse decisions, poorer performance, and health issues. Even military leaders like James Stavridis focused on sleep discipline to maintain crew effectiveness. Our peak performance comes when we are well rested, not running on fumes. Many successful and brilliant people prioritize sufficient sleep and rest. We need the discipline to stop working and go to bed to solve problems like burnout, procrastination, and lack of motivation. 
We often need better decisions and waste time in the mornings because we need more discipline the night before. Going to bed early and maintaining a consistent sleep schedule builds discipline and character, leading to better decision-making and productivity during the day. Ernest Shackleton Shackleton's Arctic Expedition provides an example of extreme endurance and fortitude. Shackleton and his crew were trapped in ice for over a year, and their ship eventually sank. Shackleton then embarked on an open sea voyage to find help, finally rescuing all his men. This shows how endurance and determination can lead to overcoming immense challenges. Many successful people throughout history have shown a willingness to endure hardship and push through difficulties. This sits flesh, the ability to sit and take until a task is done, is a trait many lacks today. Success requires commitment, sacrifice, and a refusal to quit in the face of obstacles or a hardship. We must care for our physical bodies through discipline and temperance. How we treat our bodies affects our minds and spirit. Excess and intemperance prevent the reason from working correctly. Discipline frees us from being ruled by our urges and desires. Controlling the body is critical to maintaining the mind and achieving freedom and purpose. Discipline and temperance apply not just to the body but also to the temperament, our emotional and mental state. A healthy, resourceful mind and a docile, controlled nature are required for happiness and success. History shows that physical discipline alone is not enough. We must cultivate discipline and self-control in all areas of our being. In summary, the key message is that discipline in all areas of life, physical, mental, and emotional, is required to achieve purpose and overcome challenges. Success comes from endurance, sacrifice, and a refusal to quit in the face of difficulties. Controlling the body and temperament leads to freedom and strength of mind and spirit. Temperance and self-mastery are the keys to success, happiness, and a life of meaning. Queen Elizabeth II has shown immense self-control and discipline over her 69-year reign. She was born into the monarch's role but cultivated the temperament required through hard work and dedication. The modern British monarch's role is mainly symbolic but requires an enormous amount of discipline. The queen is informed of all governmental actions but cannot overtly influence policy. She has endured this problematic role with near superhuman dignity. The queen's queen's duties require great physical stamina. She has traveled over 1 million nautical miles and met around 4 million people. Despite her age, she can stand for long periods. Her ability to endure long events comes from mental and emotional discipline, not just physical ability. The queen works intelligently and efficiently. She has streamlined tedious parts of her role, like dinners and speeches. She is known for getting things right on the first try. Her decades of experience have allowed her to master her role with ease. The queen epitomizes the stereotypical British stiff upper lip. She has remained calm during violent riots, assassination attempts, and intruders. Her ability to keep an even keel no matter the circumstance shows her immense discipline and self-control. In summary, Queen Elizabeth II's his life illustrates the power of temperament and self-discipline. Through hard work and dedication, she cultivated the level of self-control necessary to endure the difficult role of the British monarch for nearly 70 years. Her composure, efficiency, and stamina are models of discipline and mastery. The Queen is an extremely disciplined and self-controlled person. She possesses quiet brilliance and patience, allowing her to thrive in a difficult position for decades. Though not traditionally considered an intellectual, she is very well informed. She reads extensively and stays current on government documents, the news, and all matters related to her duty. She asks probing questions and uses her knowledge and experience to influence and advise gently. The Queen has endured immense change during her reign but has adapted with poison discipline. She understands that for the monarchy to endure, it must change. But change is balanced by continuity and moderation. Her self-discipline allows her to navigate abundance and privilege, upholding standards and duty. The queen holds herself to extremely high standards in all areas of her life and work. But she is not without emotion or unable to relate to others. She tolerates mistakes and puts others at ease, even while enduring intense public scrutiny and criticism gracefully. She sees accountability and press criticism as part of her role though she believes it should be delivered with gentleness, good humor, and understanding. In summary, the queen is a model of self-discipline, duty, moderation, and poison the face of immense privilege, obligation, change, and public scrutiny. Her quiet strength and wisdom have allowed the monarchy to endure. Queen Elizabeth II has served as the monarch of the UK and other Commonwealth realms for over 65 years. Despite criticisms early in her reign that she was out of touch, she adapted and modernized slowly shifting her accent and mannerisms. She endured controversial feedback with poise and grace. Great leaders like Queen Elizabeth II and George Washington show restrained, discipline, and temperance. 
They do not act impulsively or emotionally. They pause to examine situations rationally and respond judiciously. They overcome their natural instincts and passions. The pause, the space between a stimulus and a response, is crucial. It allows us to insert judgment and principles. We can ask ourselves questions to determine the best response rather than reacting instantly. Leaders must cultivate this ability to pause and think before acting. Identifying your main thing your central purpose or mission, helps give life meaning and direction. It allows you to say no to distractions and focus your time and energy. For leaders like Booker T. Washington, keeping the main thing the main thing was key to his effectiveness and productivity. If you don't do know your main thing, you lack purpose and are vulnerable to wasting time on unimportant matters. The main takeaway is that leadership requires restraint, discipline, and purpose. Leaders must pause to reason rather than act impulsively. They must focus on their central mission and avoid distractions. Developing these thought and action habits allows leaders to endure difficulties, adapt to change, and accomplish great things. Success in any field requires focused, uninterrupted time. Saying no to distractions and unimportant things is key. Everything you say yes to means saying no to something else. You can't be in two places at once or focus on more than one thing fully. It's it's impossible to commit to anything professionally or personally without the discipline to say no. Saying no gives you the power to say yes to what really matters. Feature creep happens when you try to please everyone and achieve nothing. You have to protect the core concept or mission. General Mattis refused media appearances and told officials had send them to Afghanistan if they bothered him again about it. He focused on his actual work. Ludwig van Beethoven would become so focused on his music that he would disappear from conversations. This raptus or flow state was the source of his genius. Focus is a superpower. Most people struggle to truly focus. They get distracted, tired, try to multitask, or lack the discipline to lock in. You have to put your whole mind into the main thing. Ikagrita is an intense focus on one point. It allows you to understand something in yourself in a new way. Beethoven spent years focused on single pieces of music. Gouda and Beethoven were experts at ignoring distractions and committing fully to their work. The muses bless the focused, not the unfocused. Absent-minded professors show what real commitment looks like. Their occasional social missteps matter less than the transformative work that results from their focused commitment. Every minute and ounce of brain power must be marshaled toward your most important work. That is true mastery and power. Perfectionism can be paralyzing. The drive to make something perfect often prevents creators from finishing and shipping their work. Many famous creators, including Da Vinci, Steve Jobs, and Ralph Ellison, struggled with perfectionism. Their high standards led to an inability to be satisfied and release their creations. Perfectionism is often a form of narcissism and self-consciousness, not humility or self-discipline. The perfectionist is convinced that everyone cares deeply about their work and judges them harshly. What you don't do not release is a failure. It doesn't doesn't matter the reason, perfectionism, procrastination, fear. If you don't do not ship, you fail. We must be brave enough to try, even if we might fail or be imperfect. The Stoics said we can't quit because we can't perfect something. Not trying due to fear of imperfection is cowardly. Finishing and shipping are achievements in themselves that require monumental discipline. You have to push through perfectionism to get your work out into the world. Perfect is the enemy of good and everything that might come after. Your potential and progress stall if you get stuck trying to achieve perfection. It's it's important to have collaborators and mentors who can push you past perfectionism and encourage you to ship, as Louis Horse did for Martha Graham. Their perspective and support can help rescue you from your strict standards. You can only sometimes create at the highest level. Transition works and imperfect creations are necessary to achieve more extraordinary things. Perfecting one piece can restrict your ability to move on to the next. That covers the key highlights and main takeaways from the passage on perfectionism as advice. Let me know if you want me to clarify or expand on any summary part. We are prone to wanting to keep perfecting and tweaking our work endlessly and need help knowing when to stop. We may need help with finishing projects or be perfectionists. We need partners or advisors who can balance and enforce deadlines to compensate. For example, Martha Graham, a famous choreographer, relied on her partner Louis to push her to finish and perform her pieces. With her pieces may have been completed and see the light of day without his influence. Many genius creators need these moderating forces to produce great work. Similarly, we need the self-discipline to stop tinkering and call projects done. If we can't do this ourselves, we must find partners to cut and balance us off. Martha Graham was successful enough to surround herself with yes-men but wisely chose not to. To summarize further, we should do the hard, important things first, 
in the mornings and throughout our days. Putting them off is procrastination and hurts our productivity and well-being. As Seneca said, fools are always getting ready to live. We should live and work with a sense of urgency, avoiding delays and excuses. The time to start is now. A story of boxer Floyd Patterson illustrates this well. After losing his heavyweight title in 1959 due to overconfidence and lack of discipline, he spiraled into despair. But a kind letter from his former opponent Archie Moore inspired him to return to training. Patterson became the first boxer to regain the heavyweight title, showing that defeat and backslides can be overcome. The lesson is that we will all mess up, relapse, and face defeats. But we can choose whether to be losers and quitters or to get back up and fight again. While a losing is inevitable, being defeated is a choice with the right mindset. Both wins and losses can be opportunities to improve. Like the pro boxer, we should treat setbacks as chances to get right back to work. In short, cultivating self-discipline and the right partners or influences can help us complete projects, avoid perfectionism, and bounce back from difficulties or shortcomings. The time for action is now, not tomorrow, and we always have the opportunity to learn from our failures and try again. Even the strongest and happiest people struggle at times under difficult circumstances. Viktor Frankl, the Holocaust survivor and optimist, wrote of feeling unspeakably tired, sad, and lonely after the war. Yet he chose to carry on and find meaning again. If he could do that after such horrors, we all can find the strength to continue. John F. Kennedy suffered constant severe pain due to health issues, which was made worse by stress. However, he turned to heavy medication and doctor shopping for relief making risky decisions that endangered others. Real solutions were exercise and physical therapy. We must be wary of supposed magic pills and address the root causes of problems, not just symptoms. Some pain must be endured. Epicurus is wrongly assumed to have advocated hedonism and the constant pursuit of pleasure. He taught that pleasure meant freedom from disturbance and living simply with close friends. His garden was a place for discussion, not evil. We must avoid excess and focus on what truly matters, close relationships, insight, and virtuous action. Real pleasure comes from living by nature and reason. Queen Elizabeth II has reigned for so long by living sustainably and listening to her body these needs. We should find sustainable practices and address the root causes of pain, not reach for shortcuts. The mind and body must work together temperately and moderately. The real pleasure is found in living simply and virtuously, not through excess. The key themes are pursuing sustainable solutions, avoiding excess listening to our body's body's warnings, and finding meaning and pleasure through virtuous living and close relationships, not empty or risky distractions and pursuits. True pleasure and purpose are found by facing difficulties with courage and planting our feet firmly on the ground. Epicurus advocated for living a life of moderation and temperance in pursuit of happiness and pleasure. He believed true pleasure came from living a virtuous life surrounded by friends, not indulging in excess. We must exercise discipline and self-control to avoid the pain and unhappiness of overindulgence and excess. Our bodies crave excess, so we must use our minds to curb unhealthy appetites. Seeking constant distraction and sensory pleasure leads to misery. It is better to seek purpose and meaning through self-improvement, relationships, and living according to virtue. We should not give in to provocation or retaliate when wronged. Staying calm and refusing to engage in hostility can diffuse conflict and prevent further harm. Retaliating often only makes the situation worse. We must develop the ability to ignore slights and insults, even unintentional ones, to avoid doing more damage to ourselves. The saying goes, it helps to be a little deaf. Choosing not to engage prevents small things from becoming big problems. Examples were given of Arthur Ashe's Ashe's father, William Thalheimer, Cato the Younger, and James Peck, who all remained calm and dignified when provoked or discriminated against. Their self-control allowed them to achieve their aims without escalating conflict. The overall message is that temperance, self-discipline, and refusing to engage in hostility lead to greater happiness and purpose. Indulgence of unhealthy appetites and retaliation often only brings more pain. Staying calm and in control of oneself is the superior choice. We should beware of the passions and impulses that can blind us and lead us to act rashly. Positive emotions like excitement or lust can override our judgment and cause regret. Powerful. Successful people need to exercise self-discipline over their emotions. They can afford to let passion lead them astray or cause them to make poor decisions. The key is to slow down, think things through, and not act on raw emotion. We should look for opportunities to pause before we get carried away. Stepping back and regaining control and composure is essential. Staying silent and not always speaking one's own mind shows strength and self-discipline. Powerful people are impressive because they say less, 
not more. Though they have a license to speak freely, they exercise restraint. This cultivated presence and mystique serve them well. In summary, passion should be balanced with reason and judgment. Emotion should not be the sole driver of our actions. Self-discipline, composure, and restraint are virtues that lead to success and achievement. Speaking less and exercising control over one's own tongue is a sign of wisdom and strength. Modern technology like social media encourages people to share their thoughts and opinions constantly, get into arguments, and post hot takes. This constant expression often leads to trouble and distraction rather than making a positive difference. It sits better to show restraint and choose when to speak up. You don't have to verbalize every thought or give your opinion on everything. You can sit with awkward silence, let others speak, and let your actions do the talking. Speaking less and listening more shows wisdom and self-discipline. Winston Churchill showed remarkable restraint during World War II. Despite pressure from allies and advisors, he refused to rush into battles before the time was right. He waited until Britain's Britain's military was well prepared before invading France on D-Day in 1944. His patience and strategic timing were key to the Allied victory. It sits hard to resist the urge to act when everyone else is working, or new opportunities arise. But resisting impulses and FOMO, fear of missing out, requires discipline. The people who wait for the perfect, strategic moment to act often achieve the most success. As the saying goes, beware the fury of the patient man. Life often only gives us one chance to act, so we must be ready to seize the right moment. We need the self-discipline and fortitude to wait for the perfect opening and act decisively. Success depends on preparation, timing, and restraint. A young Napoleon Bonaparte once wrote that ambition without restraint leads to unhappiness. Unlimited ambition results in constant restlessness and prevents one from enjoying life's life's simple pleasures. Some moderation and control are needed to achieve happiness and peace of mind. So, in summary, the key messages are, choose when to speak up rather than constantly expressing opinions, show restraint and patience to act strategically, resist impulses and wait for the right moment, and temper ambition with moderation to achieve greater peace and happiness. Restraint and self-discipline are virtues that lead to success and well-being. The passage discusses the dangers of unchecked ambition and the ill use of money through the examples of historical figures like Napoleon, Alexander the Great, and Winston Churchill. Napoleon wrote an essay as a youth criticizing ambition and warning against its perils, but he did not heed his advice. His dream led him to crown himself emperor, wage destructive wars, and ultimately be exiled. Alexander the Great conquered much of the known world but was never satisfied. His ambition left him empty and unhappy, and his empire collapsed after death. His conquests were for himself, not for any greater good. Ambition must be balanced and tempered. It can be an addiction, and while society rewards success, accomplishment does not necessarily bring happiness. Moderation and self-discipline are required. Winston Churchill earned and spent money quickly, living an extravagant lifestyle he could not afford. Though successful, he constantly worried about money and felt like he was sinking into the abyss. His ill use of money caused instability and anxiety, not security or freedom. True riches come from choices that lead to contentment, not worry. No matter how much one earns, if money is a source of concern, that person cannot be called rich. The main message is that ambition, success, money, and accomplishment should be pursued and used responsibly, or they can lead to unhappiness, harm, and even destruction. Moderation and self-discipline are required to achieve balance and real success. Unfettered ambition and the irresponsible use of money often do more harm than good. The author discusses the importance of continuous self-improvement and daily progress. He argues that no one is perfect and there is always room for growth. Those who believe they have reached their maximum potential stop improving, while those who maintain a mindset of constant progress continue to get better over time through daily incremental improvements. The author cites famous examples like Tom Brady, the quarterback, who is obsessed not with winning but with improving minor aspects of his game each day. The Japanese concept of Kaizen captures this idea of continual minor improvements over time. While transformative change is flashy, gradual daily progress through evolution leads to the most potent long-term results. Simply showing up and committing to daily progress puts one ahead of most people. Through a virtuous cycle, finding small ways to improve each day or make fewer mistakes compounds over time. Though the goals posts are constantly moved out of reach, this process brings the most satisfaction and allows one to reach new heights. One either improves each day or worsens, there is no standing still. The author argues that this mindset can benefit anyone in any profession or role in life. One can continually improve how they think, focus, and act. Using examples from Stoic philosophers like Epictetus, 
The author shows how focusing on what is within one's own control, continuous self-improvement, can provide purpose and mean regardless of one's own external circumstances. Progress is a personal matter, not defined by metrics, achievements, or the opinions of others. In summary, the key message is that daily progress through continuous improvement is a lifelong process that leads to growth and meaning. Maintaining high standards that increase over time prevents plateaus and pushes one to new levels of excellence. Though perfection is unattainable, pursuing self-improvement for its own sake brings a sense of purpose and direction. Continual progress should be a daily discipline for its rewards. Progress matters more than what others think of us. Focusing on continuous self-improvement and learning helps us maintain a sense of purpose and meaning. Progress compounds over a lifetime into extraordinary results. We cannot do everything ourselves and should delegate when possible. Sharing responsibilities and asking for help allows us to focus our time and energy on the most important things. It reduces stress and prevents burnout. Delegating is a sign of strength, not weakness. We must respect and value time, our most precious resource. Precisely managing time allows us to maximize its use. Wasting time is foolish. We are always in the game and must make the most of each moment and opportunity. Time is always running out, so we should not take it for granted. Discipline in small time increments leads to significant results. Progress, delegation, and time management are interconnected. They allow us to do meaningful work, contribute value, and lead purposeful lives. We must adopt the habits and mindsets to utilize our talents in the time we are given. Time is a limited and precious resource. Once it's gone, you can never get it back. We must make the most of our time and avoid wasting it. Establishing routines and disciplined habits help us manage our time effectively. Being purposeful about how we spend our time, keeping our desks clean, sticking to schedules, and avoiding distractions, allows us to accomplish more. Reflecting on how we've spent our time in the past can reveal wasted opportunities and inspire us to use the present moment better. Although time will ultimately dictate the end of our lives, we dictate how we spend the time we have. Maintaining boundaries and privacy allows us to focus on what matters. Oversharing and lack of restraint are common in today's today's world, but keeping some distance and minding our own business leads to greater effectiveness and happiness. Strong, dignified individuals set boundaries to govern their own lives, interactions, and responsibilities. They are incurrently concerned with what others think of them and can push back against demands that don't do not serve them. They keep their emotions and personal lives private. Energy vampires needy, selfish people who sap others' energy with their drama and dysfunction, can be kept at a distance by maintaining solid boundaries. Letting these types of people into our lives in an uncontrolled way leads to being overwhelmed and stretched too thin. Life's life's most important work is often done by people who value their privacy. The happiest and strongest individuals don't do need constant external validation. They contain their lives within appropriate boundaries. While some people may seem to get away with poor behavior due to a lack of boundaries, maintaining your limits is the key to effectiveness and well-being. You can control others, you can only govern yourself. The key aspect of the magisterial level is self-mastery, achieving mastery over one's own physical, mental, and spiritual self. This level of self-discipline transcends both the physical self, the bodily, and the intellectual self, the mind. It requires going beyond what is expected or required and finding extra gear to give more of oneself. Reaching the magisterial level is extraordinarily rare. It is more than just physical discipline or mental brilliance, it combines them in the arena of public life and as a contributor to society. It means achieving stillness and balance not in isolation but in the chaos of real life, surrounded by temptation and regardless of external pressures or perceptions. At the magisterial level, one rules oneself like a sovereign, not a subject. Some responsibilities come with this self-mastery, including to one's own potential, society, cause, family, and those who look up to or go after you. Life will test this mastery by demanding the heroic, requiring one to align body, mind, and spirit to achieve more than possible and give more than ever. The key traits of the magisterial level are, self-mastery, mastery of body, mind, and spirit. Rare and transcendent. Going beyond ordinary discipline and restraint and achieving stillness and balance not in isolation but in real life. Rules oneself as a sovereign, has self-governance responsibilities, not obedience. Gives more than thought possible, finds extra gear to give more of oneself. Aligns body, mind, and spirit, achieves more than ordinarily possible through this alignment. Tested by life's life's demands, pushed to the heroic by circumstances requiring transcendence of perceived limits. The magisterial level is the pinnacle of self-discipline and character, 
achieved by few and aspirational for all in the quest for excellence and purpose. It is a call to transcend perceived limits and give your deepest gifts. Antoninus Pius worked for decades to become Emperor of Rome. When Hadrian finally named him successor, it was merely as a placeholder for Marcus Aurelius, a boy Hadrian favored. Despite this unfair situation, Antoninus committed himself fully to the role. As emperor, Antoninus had nearly absolute power over millions of subjects but was famously temperate, gentle, and devoted to serving the people. He avoided violence and excess, earning the title pious dutiful, virtuous. Though his reign was largely successful, his temperance and humility meant he did not gain lasting fame. Antoninus cared for his health and modeled discipline, endurance, and moderation for Marcus Aurelius. He enjoyed pleasures in moderation and endured difficulties without complaint. He approached all tasks with energy and commitment. Antoninus had a calm, thoughtful temperament. He made careful, well-considered decisions and asked probing questions. He admitted mistakes, tolerated criticism, and listened to experts. He rarely showed anger or lost control of his emotions, even under stress. Though Antoninus had tremendous power and responsibility, he lived simply and without pretension or dependence on luxury. If comforts were available, he used them, if not, he didn't didn't miss them. His strictness was balanced by an ability to find joy and pleasure in life. Above all, Antoninus Pius provides an example of how to possess great power, wealth, and status without losing one's own soul, with temperance, duty, kindness, and humility. His relationship with Marcus Aurelius shows the beauty of self-discipline and mentorship. Together, they achieved unlikely greatness, given the circumstances that brought them together. Antoninus Pius was a virtuous, modest, and self-disciplined Roman emperor who served as a role model for his adopted son and successor Marcus Aurelius. Marcus Aurelius faced many crises during his reign but maintained his equanimity through it all, just as Antoninus had taught him. He was a philosopher king who lived humbly and ruled justly. Marcus named his stepbrother Lucius Verus co-emperor, showing his generosity and faith in the shared rule. Though very different, Marcus appreciated how Verus helped him to improve himself. Marcus gave himself strict rules and maintained high standards, though he understood others' imperfections. He endured poor health and difficult circumstances with stoicism. Marcus tried to learn from his mistakes and always do his best to be a good leader, as Antoninus had shown him. His meditations and actions provide an example of an ideal virtuous ruler. Marcus Aurelius showed great leadership by taking responsibility and making difficult but morally right choices that cost him personally. He avoided easy fixes like raising taxes or eluding and selling imperial possessions to solve financial problems. Marcus cultivated an admirable character, focused on what mattered rather than titles or honors. He worked hard to improve himself through philosophy and by being present and attentive. He tried to make good choices, see the best in others, and lead through service. He avoided scandal and cruelty. Although Marcus strove for an impossible ideal of being unaffected by fortune or external events, his efforts allowed him to access a higher level of excellence and purpose. His example, like his adoptive father Antoninus, can inspire us to follow in their footsteps through self-discipline. We should hold ourselves to high standards as they did but be tolerant and forgiving of others who do not measure up or choose a different path. Like Cato the Younger, we can be strict with ourselves but lenient with others. We cannot expect everyone to match our willpower and commitments. Success often comes from driving oneself hard, but trying to impose the same rigor on others usually backfires. We must remember that others have different abilities, knowledge, priorities, and tolerance for austerity. Forcing our standards on them will likely fail and damage relationships. The desire to condemn others for failing to meet our standards is a frequent cause of anger and frustration. But we must accept that people are different and allow them to live as they choose. Our role is to set an inspiring example through our dedication not mandate how others should live. Like Gandhi, we can show grace and refrain from judgment. Overall, we should cultivate our character and purpose, focus on self-improvement over enforcing standards on others, and lead through inspiration, not a mandate. Strict with yourself, tolerant of others. Colin Powell kept the fact that he slept in his office a secret from his staff to not burden them with matching his sacrifice and discipline. Like Abraham Lincoln, he did not demand perfection from others that he expected from himself. Discipline is complex and internal. We each have enough to worry about improving ourselves, not judging others. Understanding this should make us less harsh and more compassionate. Queen Elizabeth II and Prince Philip struggled with being strict yet understanding with their children and siblings. It is better to follow the examples of Cato and Marcus Aurelius, who found things to appreciate in others and use their weaknesses to strengthen themselves. 
True discipline leads to kindness, not loneliness. George VI and Cato the Younger made others better through their examples, not by forcing them. They inspired generations through their self-discipline and courage under pressure. We can all choose role models to guide us to reach our potential. The self-discipline, like Churchill, Florence Nightingale, and Marcus Aurelius, make others better by their example and overflowing inspiration. They show what is possible and call us to step up. We may be celebrated or hated for it, but we must do right and conquer ourselves. Our discipline can positively affect others, even if they don't do and appreciate it yet. Hemingway defined courage as grace under pressure, poison discipline when it counts. The Queen has shown this calmness during threats and crises, saying it demonstrates character. Marcus Aurelius believes strength comes from a calm mind, not anger or complaining. Developing self-control and emotional discipline takes years of practice and perseverance. In summary, proper discipline is internal, not forced upon others. Self-discipline makes the world better through inspiration, not judgment. Their grace under pressure comes from calmness of mind and strength of character developed over a lifetime. Leaders display poise and grace under pressure. They maintain self-control even in difficult situations. Examples include Napoleon remaining calm in battle and a Roman knight named Pastor hiding his grief while dining with the Emperor Caligula just after Caligula had Pastor's pastor's son executed. Leaders make sacrifices for the benefit of others. They endure hardships so their followers don't do have to. Examples include General Mattis taking over guard duty on Christmas so a soldier could be with his family and Xenophon carrying a soldier's soldier's shield during a march. Success and power often require more responsibility and sacrifice, not less. Leaders work hard and put others first. They follow the rules and set a good example. It is essential for leaders to be kind to themselves. While self-discipline is necessary, scolding and criticizing yourself is counterproductive. No one is perfect, so leaders should avoid being too self-critical. Examples were provided of Cleanthes advising a man berating himself and comparing himself to imperfect leaders like Jackie Robinson. In summary, influential leaders display poise under pressure, make sacrifices for others, work hard, and hold themselves to high standards while also being kind to themselves. Success requires more responsibility, not less. Leaders endure difficulties so others don't do to have to. Queen Elizabeth remarked that if George Washington voluntarily gave up power after the Revolutionary War, he would be the most incredible man in the world. Washington voluntarily relinquished control twice, first after the war by resigning his military commission and again after two terms as president. This showed immense self-discipline and virtue. Most leaders cannot resist the temptation of power and control. They cling to it even as it corrupts them. But the great leaders, like Washington, Marcus Aurelius, and Ananias, did not need power and could share it or give it away. This demonstrated their strength, independence, calmness, and focus on what mattered. Similarly, Martin Luther King Jr. demonstrated immense self-discipline and virtue in the face of violence. At a speaking event, a white man savagely beat King in front of hundreds of people. But King did not retaliate with violence. He turned the other cheek, allowing himself to continue being abused as a demonstration of non-violence and love. This show of restraint and principle stunned even his attacker into pausing, allowing others to intervene. King showed that nonviolence requires immense courage and self-control. The examples of these great leaders show that true power, virtue, and discipline come from within, not from titles, control, or dominance over others. It is the ability to restrain destructive impulses and act with principle. This internal strength and self-discipline are the mark of a great leader. Martin Luther King Jr. showed immense courage, discipline, and compassion by not retaliating against a man who punched him in the face. King understood that nonviolence was a spiritual principle that required suffering and sacrifice. Even ordinary people could reach new heights through love, forgiveness, and grace. Sandra Day O'Connor O'Connor showed a lifetime of commitment to her husband, John, even as he descended into Alzheimer's Alzheimer's and eventually fell in love with another woman, forgetting O'Connor O'Connor entirely. O'Connor cooperated with the story to raise awareness, saying she was happy if it made John happy, even though it must have broken her heart. Commitment requires vulnerability, sacrifice, and continually turning the other cheek. The evacuation of Dunkirk during World War II showed immense heroism, poise, and discipline. Though defeated, the orderly retreat inspired Britain and showed Churchill they could prevail. The retreat is often the most complicated move, requiring courage and discipline to admit defeat and live to fight another day. Socrates showed discipline during the retreat from battle by maintaining order and continuing to fight as he left the field. The way one retreat matters more than retreating itself. Abandoning one's own shield endangered comrades, so Spartans would return with their shield or on it. 
The collapse of will and stubborn refusal to retreat are both vices. One must know when to disengage to fight another day. Hope is not a strategy, denial is not determination, and delusion is destructive. One must avoid throwing good money after bad and recognize when to change course. Rocky Marciano showed self-control by retiring before his skills declined too far. Lou Gehrig benched himself to avoid harming his team. Dean Acheson resigned as Treasury Undersecretary rather than obey FDR's FDR's unlawful order. Discipline requires knowing when to exit. The key themes are that courage, poise, compassion, commitment, and discipline are required to charge ahead and retreat when necessary. However tricky, admitting defeat and changing course can be a victory. The way one exits matters greatly. Dean Acheson was FDR's FDR's Secretary of State. After disagreeing with FDR on a legal issue, Acheson submitted a polite letter of resignation and attended his replacement's replacement swearing-in ceremony. Even though he disagreed with FDR, Acheson acted with dignity and grace. FDR later told others to emulate Acheson's Acheson's example of how to resign appropriately. The key lessons are, put your ego aside and accept defeat graciously. Walk away when needed. Keep your composure even when things are falling apart. Pay your debts, take responsibility for mistakes, and communicate clearly. Have a plan for what comes next. Retreats are temporary. Endure difficulties courageously and then go on the offensive again. Beethoven contemplated suicide in 1802 due to health issues, failed romances, lack of recognition, and the wars in his homeland. But his devotion to his art gave him the strength to endure. We would have few of his famous works if he had given up. Endurance and courage are required to overcome life's life's difficulties. To endure is to be superior to hardship and not give up. Endurance is a quiet, uncomplaining perseverance in the face of suffering. Many inspiring examples of endurance exist, like Anne Frank, Stephen Hawking, and enslaved people who survived immense suffering. They prove themselves greater than their circumstances through endurance. We can endure too. The philosopher Posidonius told Pompey to be the best and always superior to others by conquering his selfish impulses, not by defeating enemies. How one does, something is more important than what one does. Some choose greatness in their work over being a great person, but the two do not have to be opposed. Temperance and character can polish a great life. Marcus Aurelius and Queen Elizabeth are examples of great leaders due to their character, not just their positions. The greatest masters in any field care more about the excellence of character than rewards like money or fame. Self-discipline is about becoming the best you can be, not about punishment or deprivation. It sits about overcoming your flaws and weaknesses. Successful people are driven to improve and push themselves, not to beat others. They are battling their selfish instincts and desires, not external competitors. Pompey is an example of someone who compromised his principles in pursuit of power and glory. His ambition and desire to win led him to ally with tyrants, ultimately leading to his downfall. Flexibility and adaptability are strengths. As you achieve mastery in an area, you risk becoming rigid in your thinking and methods. Musashi cultivated adaptability to avoid this, studying poetry and changing his approach. Successful people can balance upholding their principles while adapting to changing circumstances. Churchill honored tradition but rejected convention. Queen Elizabeth II has endured by changing with the times while keeping the monarchy. Inflexibility can lead to becoming trapped by outdated thinking and doomed to fail. Some become more rigid as they age or die to find success. Angela Merkel is an example of someone seemingly unchanged by her success and power. Despite becoming Chancellor of Germany, she has maintained her ordinary lifestyle and humble attitude. Her self-discipline is focused inward, not on status or glory. The key message is that self-discipline should cultivate balance, flexibility, and humility. Success should not lead to rigid thinking, status-seeking, or losing one's own principles. True self-mastery means constantly improving and avoiding these pitfalls. Self-discipline is a virtue that demands more of itself but only sometimes gets easier to achieve. The rewards for success provide many temptations to become lazy and indulge oneself. Virtues like courage, justice, and wisdom are only meaningful with self-discipline to put them into action. Freedom and rights also require self-discipline and personal responsibility. A lack of self-control can undermine even the strongest system of government. Talking and writing about virtue is easy, but we aim to improve ourselves by answering the call to live virtuously. Contemplating truth means nothing without acting on it. Cultivating virtue means living a disciplined life. Great individuals like Marcus Aurelius, Lou Gehrig, Queen Elizabeth II, and Floyd Patterson were not perfect but showed virtue and self-discipline at critical moments. Their words matter less than their deeds and character. They inspire through their achievements and endurance. 
We honor virtuous figures of the past by continuing their work and polishing our virtue through action, not empty words. At each crossroads, we must choose to live virtuously. The Bible phrase thou mayest suggests we have a choice in how we live rather than following strict commandments. Self-discipline gives us the power to choose a virtuous path. The key message is that virtue requires effort and action, not just knowledge or words. Self-discipline is vital to living a moral life, and we honor moral exemplars by following their lead. Though difficult, the choice to be virtuous is always available to us. The author struggled for two years to start writing his book on temperance. He felt despair and a crisis of confidence in his ability to write the book. On a hot day going through his research notes, he found an old letter he had written to himself, trust the process. Keep doing my cards. When I check them in June, if I have done my work, there will be a book there. This note reminded him to have self-discipline and gave him the motivation to continue working on the book. The author refined his daily writing routine during the pandemic. He would wake up early, walk with his kids, journal, then focus on writing for a couple of hours. He maintained this discipline and routine, saying no to distractions and concentrating on his work. The author sees parenting his young children as requiring and building discipline. He tries to be present with them, not rushing through time together. He appreciates the moments with his family. Over 18 months during the pandemic, he had 500 consecutive nights at home with his family. Through maintaining his routine and discipline, the author eventually wrote and completed his book on temperance. Discipline and courage in the face of difficulties were key. The key themes are that discipline, routine, focus, and courage help the author overcome obstacles and complete his work. Trusting in the process and maintaining consistency were essential. Appreciating time with family also fueled his motivation and discipline. The author tries to maintain discipline in all areas of his life to stay productive and happy. He exercises, eats healthy, avoids unhealthy habits, limits negative media, checks his ego, controls his temper, prioritizes sleep, and eliminates unnecessary tasks. He had lunch with Manu Ginobili, an NBA champion, who told a story about losing in the 2013 NBA Finals. After a devastating loss in Game 7, Ginobili realized he wasn't twisting having any fun. He changed his mindset, focused on enjoying himself, and became more balanced. The following year, the Spurs won the championship. Ginobili learned that discipline is about more than winning, it sits about flourishing as a human. The author tried to improve his discipline and balance while writing this book. In the past, the stress of writing made him act out, but this time he maintained better boundaries and priorities. Though the process was tiring, he felt beautiful in the end. Discipline is challenging but meaningful. With effort, accomplishments would be satisfying. Discipline, balance, and temperance separate the strong from the weak. The author provides a list of book recommendations for further reading. He also offers a larger reading list for those interested. The author thanks his editors, agent, team, in-laws, wife, children, and influences for their support. His wife, in particular, supports his routines and habits, and his children have given him more discipline and focus. In summary, the key message is that discipline in all areas of life, including work, leads to happiness and flourishing. Maintaining balance boundaries, and a positive mindset are essential to discipline and success. Difficulty and effort make accomplishments meaningful. Support from others enables the field. We naturally summarize thoughts and ideas. Summarizing takes practice and commitment. Examples of summarizing various sentences and thoughts around, turning 78 years old the British royal family's family's tax responsibilities a quote wrongly attributed to sham for the jacket JFK wore when he was assassinated balancing self-discipline and enjoyment of life the failed Bay of Pigs invasion teaching JFK a lesson Napoleon letting his physical discipline and shape decline guarding against greed and being generous Marcus Aurelius's Aurelius's failures as a father George Washington freed his slaves as an act of moral courage asking for help shows perseverance not defeat the LA Rams are learning to relax and adapt to win the Super Bowl need to focus on what matters in summary, the key ideas around summarizing and the examples given show, summarizing is a useful skill that takes practice important historical figures and events can provide lessons finding the right balance of discipline, generosity, focus, and perseverance is key learning from failures and adapting is how we grow and improve book link click here.